The Red Man of the West by Eliza R. Snow The great spirit, tis said, to our forefathers gave all the lands twixt eastern and western big wave, and the Indian was happy he'd nothing to fear as he ranged o'er the mountains in chase of the deer. And he felt like a prince as he steered the canoe or explored the lone wild with his hatchet and bow, quenched his thirst at the streamlet, or simply he fed the heavens were his curtains, the hillock his bed. Say then, was he homeless? No, no, his heart beat for the dear ones he loved in the wigwam retreat. But a wreck of the white man came over the wave, and the chains of the tyrant he'd learned to enslave. Emerging with bondage and pale with distress, he fled from oppression, he came to oppress. Yes, such was the white man invested with power, when almost devoured he turned and devour. He seized our possessions and fattening with pride, he thirsted for glory but freedom, he cried. Our fathers were brave, they contented a while, then left the invader the coveted soil. The spoiler pursued them, our fathers went on, and their children are now at the low setting sun. The white man, yet prouder, would grasp all the shore, he smuggled and purchased and coveted more. The pompered blue eagle is stretching its crest beside the great waters that circle the west. Behind the west wood where the Indian retires, the white man is building his opposite fires to fell the last forest and burn up the wild which nature designed for her wandering child. Chased into envious and nowhere to fly, too weak to contend and unwilling to die. Oh, where will a place for the Indian be found? Shall he take to the skies or retreat underground? I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Do any of you listen to my Book of Mormon podcast? If you've been following along since Marie took over for David Michael, you'll know that she has a bit of a crush on Oliver Cowdery. <laughs> Understandably, though, he, he was a fascinating guy in Mormon history. Although he's fallen out of vogue in our timeline, he just remained in Richmond, Missouri as a lawyer since the, uh, the excommunication in the, you know, the great D-Day purging in 1838. He's still alive. He's doing his Ollie thing in Missouri. This episode isn't about Ollie or Marie or my book of Mormon. I asked if you listen because I recently told Marie a little bit about somebody in Mormon history who's near and dear to my heart, and I want to tell all of you about her today. So that's what we're doing today, my historical crush. <laughs> I hope you all don't mind uh, indulging me a little bit for today. And I'm going to be relying heavily on her own words today, out of her biography of her brother, Lorenzo Snow, which she published in Utah in 1884. That was three years before her death at the age of 83. The language in that biography says our and we a lot, and we can track her movements through this biography of her brother. And she's nice enough to even insert little bits and pieces about herself throughout that biography. So I'm going to do my best to bring Eliza Snow to life in your mind today using her own words to do so. Really, history is nothing if we can't see and feel the experiences of the real people who lived through the events that we cover. Eliza Roxy Snow was born January 21st, 1804, to Oliver and Rosetta Pettibone Snow. Eliza grew up in a charmed and a relatively well-educated household where religious dogma was almost entirely absent in the Snow household. Quote, our father was a native of Massachusetts, our mother of Connecticut, and were descendants of the genuine Puritan stock, those who fled from religious persecution in the Old World and landed on Plymouth Rock of historic celebrity. 
Early in the settlement of that portion of country, now known as the Middle States, our parents, with their family consisting of two daughters, Lenora Abigail and Eliza Roxy, the writer of this history, left the home of their youth and moved to what was at that period considered the extreme west, or, as it was sometimes styled, the jumping-off place, and settled in Mantua, Portage County, Ohio, making the eleventh family in that township. Their two daughters and three sons were added to the family, to wit, Amanda Percy, Melissa, Lorenzo, Lucius Augustus, and Samuel Pierce. Many times, and with intense interest, have their children listened to recitals of the hardships of our parents encountered, and the privations they endured in that new and heavily timbered country, so very forbidding when compared with the beautiful prairie landscapes of the West. But as true and worthy representatives of our noble ancestors, our parents were proof against discouragement, surmounted every difficulty, and through the blessing of God on their efforts, created for themselves and their children an enviable home. In their religious faith, our parents were by profession Baptists, but not of rigid iron bedstead order. Their house was a resort for the good and intelligent of all denominations, and their hospitality was proverbial. Thus, as their children grew up, they had ample opportunities for forming acquaintances with the erudite of all religious persuasions. End quote. Eliza Snow was absolutely brilliant. We featured some of her poems on this show, but the few that have been read here only barely scratched the surface of her sharp brilliance. She had been educated beyond many of her contemporaries, and she began publishing as early as 1825 or 26, when she was the age of 20 or 21. She had been educated in the local Presbyterian Academy, but also learned all the typical homemaking skills as were frequently passed from mother's two daughters. Beyond that, her first job was working in her dad's office. Oliver Snow was a justice of the peace, and Eliza helped with paperwork and earned a little bit of money to sock away into savings at the time. That money came in handy pretty soon, too, which we'll get to in a minute. Whatever the less significant circumstances of her upbringing, Eliza cultivated a snarky and mischievous wit, and all of her poems are truly brilliant. They strike autobiographical tendencies in some respects, and others are social commentary, and some of them are a bit too esoteric for my amateur brain to even begin deciphering. She published over 500 poems throughout her life. Who knows how many she actually wrote? Eliza was a bit counter to the conventions of her day. Her brother, Lorenzo, began rising through military distinctions in his schooling. Eliza apparently was a bit jealous of her brother's accomplishments, or possibly of being granted the ability to work up military ranks and gain social status, which accompanied said ranks. Apparently, Eliza didn't like her brother being a member of the military for the inherent dangers such a career path inevitably includes. However, her language seems to also exhibit some jealousy just for sh sheer virtue of the military distinction. Quote, Although religiously trained from infancy up to this time, my brother had devoted little or no attention to the subject of religion, at least not sufficiently to decide in preference of any particular sect. In the progress of his development, his ambition strongly led in the direction of military distinction, so much so that, watching with a sisterly, jealous eye, the steps one by one by which he gained promotion in the military road to honor, I feared lest in the course of human events his path might lead to the battlefield and his earthly career prematurely close on a gory bed. I frequently pled, entreated, and at times exhausted my stock of persuasion, but without effect. End quote. Regardless of apprehensions or jealousies, Eliza made Lorenzo's military uniform for him. She was quite well known as a seamstress throughout her life, adorning some of the most extravagant clothing to grace the presence of the destitute Mormons in Utah. Likely all of it was of her own make. She had a sense for flair and a unique eye for fashion to clothe her reportedly slender and temptuous physique. The Snow family joined Campbellite baptism in Ohio around 1828 when they moved to Mantua, Ohio, and that's about 30 miles south of Kirtland. Cindy Rigdon was one of the most prominent preachers of Campbellism in the area, and they likely attended a number of his sermons as he traveled the area preaching to any church that would grant him audience. 
A quick side note on that point, Rigdon had two years prior to this broken off from Alexander Campbell, who'd been his mentor for upwards of a decade by that point. Rigdon was a little bit too firebrand with the communalism and other stuff that uh, Campbell wasn't really cool with. Rigdon was running his own version of Christianity for a few years here before he teamed up with Joe to turn Mormonism into what it eventually became. So that's just a little bit of the uh, the historical background for that area. Needless to say, Joe and Emma Smith moved to Kirtland soon after this, and the Rigdonites converted to Mormonism. Eliza Snow first met the self-proclaimed prophet in 1831, when the earliest group of Mormons arrived in the town. Eliza closely examined Joseph Smith, and, you know, she possibly was interpreting what she saw through the lens of the relatively new pseudoscience of phrenology. Hopefully this quote illustrates that fact. In the winter of 1830 and 31, Joseph Smith called at my father's, and as he sat warming himself, I scrutinized his face as closely as I could without attracting his attention, and decided that his was an honest face. My adopted motto, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good, prompted me to investigate, as incredulous as I was, and the most impressive testimonies I had ever heard were given by two of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon— at the first meeting of the believers in Joseph Smith's mission, which I attended. On the 5th of April, 1835, I was baptized by a Mormon elder, and in the evening of that day I realized the baptism of the Spirit as sensibly as I did that of the water in the stream. I had retired to bed, and as I was reflecting on the wonderful events transpiring around me, I felt an indescribable, tangible sensation, if I may so call it, commencing at my head and enveloping my person and passing off at my feet, producing inexpressible happiness. Immediately following, I saw a beautiful candle with an unusual, long, bright blaze directly over my feet. I sought to know the interpretation and received the following. The lamp of intelligence shall be lighted over your path. I was satisfied. End quote. Amazing, isn't it? Eliza first meets Joe at one of these prayer meetings of some sort, probably partook of the Lord's Supper, and then had an incredible and indescribable set of feelings come over her, starting at her head and then enveloping her entire body, and then she notices that a candle looks kind of funny, almost like she was hallucinating or something. After this transcendental experience, she joined the Mormonite sect, and all that money that she'd saved up from having her poems published and helping her dad in the Justice of the Peace office and any of the other odd jobs of seamstress work or whatever she could get income from, that money came in handy. Back to her biography of Lorenzo Snow, quote, Soon after my arrival, I sent for the building committee of the Kirtland Temple, and on my asking them if they would like a little money, they replied that they had a payment to make soon and did not know where the means was coming from. I do not recollect how much I gave them. However, it was sufficient to cover the present liability of the committee, who felt greatly relieved, and proposed to send me their note of hand for the amount. I told them that I did not want a note. They were welcome to the money. However, they sent the note, and some time after wished me to accept a house and lot, thus redeeming their note. The lot was a very valuable one. Situated near the temple with fruit trees, an excellent spring of water, and a house that accommodated two families, it was truly an enviable situation, and although I was teaching the prophet's family school and had my home with them, my eldest sister, a widow with two children, wanted a home in Kirtland, and I rented one part of the house while she occupied the other. In all this, the hand of God was too plainly visible to be mistaken, as will be manifest in the following events." End quote. That passage, that's when she moved in with Joseph and Emma Smith into their Kirtland home. Now, this right here is likely when she and Joseph's relationship developed to a point where Joseph would eventually feel comfortable asking her to become one of his wives. During her stay with the Smiths in spring of 1836, Eliza taught a select school for young ladies, in addition to teaching the very young Smith child, Joseph Smith III, who was just about to reach kindergarten age at this time. Eliza Snow describes her relationship with Joseph, and I'm reading this from Todd Compton's In Sacred Loneliness. Quote, Eliza had ample opportunity to mark Joseph Smith's daily walk and conversation as a prophet of God, 
And the more I became acquainted with him, the more I appreciated him as such. His lips ever flowed with instruction and kindness, and although very forgiving, indolent, and affectionate in his temperament, when his godlike intuition suggested that the welfare of his brethren or the interests of the kingdom of God demanded it, no fear of censure, no love of approbation could prevent his severe and cutting rebuke. Though his expansive mind grasped the great plan of salvation and solved the mystic problem of man's destiny, though he had in his possession keys that unlocked the past and the future with its succession of eternities, in his devotions he was as humble as a little child. End quote. Eliza continued faithful membership in the church through the challenging year of 1838 in Missouri. Through all of it, she and Emma cultivated a very close sense of sisterhood. Eliza remained a stalwart member of the church from that time forward, from her conversion on. She spent many of her days in close company with the highest-ranking Mormon elites. She recounts what she witnessed during the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony. Quote, I will relate one more remarkable circumstance which transpired in that interesting season, a circumstance which was not confined to either section of the temple, but was witnessed by the many who were congregated on that day, and certainly all now living who were present on that occasion will remember. It is a testimony of answer to prayer that never can be forgotten. Father Smith presided over the meeting in the northwest section of the temple, and after the meeting was opened by singing, he opened his mouth in prayer and in course of supplication he very earnestly prayed that the Spirit of God might be poured out as on the day of Pentecost, that it might come as a rushing mighty wind. Sometime after, in the midst of the exercises of the foreknown, it did come. And whether Father Smith had forgotten what he had prayed for, or whether in the fervency of his heart, when praying he did not realize what he had prayed for, I never ascertained. But... When the sound came and filled the house with an expression of great astonishment, he raised his eyes, exclaiming, What? Is the house on fire? But presently he comprehended the cause of his alarm and was filled with unspeakable joy. End quote. Since Eliza joined the church, she was the Forrest Gump of Mormon history. She was there for every major occurrence from 1835 on. Here's another fun entry in her biography of her brother, which really is just as much a biography of her as she witnessed all of these events firsthand as well. As chaos continued to build in Kirtland, the Warren Parish incident happened. It was a hostile takeover of the Sunday services. In reading this, I actually learned a detail that I had never known before concerning what happened here. Here we go. Quote, Warren Parish, who had been a humble, successful preacher of the gospel, was the ringleader of this apostate party. One Sabbath morning, he, with several of his party, came into the temple armed with pistols and bowie knives and seated themselves together in the ironic pulpits on the east end of the temple, while Father Smith and others, as usual, occupied those of the Melchizedek priesthood on the west. Soon after the usual opening services, one of the brethren on the west stand rose, and just after he commenced to speak, one on the east end interrupted him. Father Smith, presiding, called to order. He told the apostate brother that he should have all the time he wanted, but he must wait his turn. As the brother on the west took the floor and commenced first to speak, he must not be interrupted. A fearful scene ensued, the apostate speaker becoming so clamorous that Father Smith called for the police to take that man out of the house when Parrish, John Boynton, and others drew their pistols and bowie knives and rushed down from the stand into the congregation. John Boynton saying he would blow out the brains of the first man who dared to lay hands on him. Many in the congregation, especially women and children, were terribly frightened. Some tried to escape from the confusion by jumping out of the windows. Amid screams and shrieks, the policemen, in ejecting the belligerents, knocked down a stovepipe, which fell helter-skelter among the people. But, although bowie knives and pistols were wrested from their owners and thrown hither and thither to prevent disastrous results, no one was hurt. And after a short but terrible scene to be enacted in the temple of God, order was restored, and the services of the day proceeded as usual. But the next day, Father Smith and sixteen others were arrested on complaint of the apostate party, charged with riot and bound over for their appearance in court to answer to the charge. 
With others, I was subpoenaed as a witness, and I found the court scene as amusing as the temple scene was appalling. The idea of such a man as Father Smith, so patriarchal in appearance, so circumspect in deportment and dignified in his manners, being guilty of riot, was at once ludicrous and farcical to all sane-minded persons. And after the four Gentile lawyers, two for each party, had expended their stock of wit, the court dismissed the case with no cause for action, and Father Smith and his associates came off triumphant. End quote. Yeah, I was unaware that a number of the church officials, including Big Daddy Shees himself, were called in on complaint by Parrish and his posse the following day after this incident. Honestly, I, I got to say, if there's one moment we could be a fly on the wall for in Mormon history that would serve as a microcosm for the entirety of Mormon history, this would be it. Parish and company coming in, brandishing pistols and bowie knives, taking over the congregation, a fight ensues, guns thrown from the hands of the would-be usurpers, probably firing as they hit the ground, men yelling at each other, punching, kicking, you know, a proper barroom brawl. Then the cops run in and forcefully remove the troublemakers, and all of this results in complaints of battery and assault being filed against the highest-ranking Mormon elites? I mean, just to see this scenario play out, it'd just be amazing. Now, in all of this writing, Eliza's wit is profound, to say the least. Now, it comes through a little bit in her writing style in this biography, but truly, this is just a nice morning jog to her writing abilities, whereas her poetry were the sprints and the marathons. I would encourage any of you wanting a deeper look into the mind of Eliza Snow, read this biography, or at least the first nine chapters to get into Nauvoo. Eliza was simply amazing. And uh, you'll actually find links in the show notes for her poetry and for this biography. I have to say, folks, I think I might be falling in love. <laughs> My little heart's going pitter-patter. So after the falling out of the church in Kirtland, the Snow family made their way to far west, Missouri, in April of 1838, and that's where they put down roots. But it was all for naught. They would only remain there for about 10 months before the extermination order was carried out and the Mormons were removed from Missouri. Quote, On leaving far west, we directed our course to the Missouri River, where we found a camp of our brethren, some of whom were intending to go down the river and return to their homes, somewhere in the southern part of the state. We joined together in constructing a kind of watercraft. It was not a canoe, neither a skiff or a raft, and to name it a boat would be preposterous, but whatever its proper cognomen, its capacity was sufficient to accommodate five men. And on the 17th of October, in the midst of a heavy fall of snow, we launched it and started on a most perilous passage down the turbid waters of a turbulent river. At that season of the year, the stream was very low, and frequently through the day we experienced much difficulty in following the channel. We took turns in rowing, and as night approached, we began in sober earnest to look for a suitable landing, but were forced to continue on until it was quite dark, when we were every moment in danger of being upset by sawyers, for we could hardly discern them in time to shun them. Those sawyers were trees or parts of trees, one end firmly embedded in the bottom of the stream, while the other end, by the motion and pressure of the current, was constantly vacillating up and down, often swiftly and powerfully. We met with several narrow escapes, and anxiously watched for a place of landing. At length we espied upon the bank a bright light, to which we directed our course, and, much to our relief, were enabled to bring our little bark safely to land. And after securing it, we climbed up the bank, and directly found ourselves in the presence of rough, savage-looking fellows, who told us they were hunters and trappers. But their appearance and conversation and the whisperings of the spirit impressed us at once with the feeling that there was more safety on the river, searching our way amid the threatening sawyers, than in remaining through the night in such forbidding company. Accordingly, we again embarked and pushed into the fluctuating stream. It was very dark, and we cautiously wended our way. Our ears were ever and anon saluted with the fearful sounds of the dashing sawyers ahead. It was prudent to keep as close to the bank as possible, in order to avail ourselves of the first opportunity to secure a landing. End quote. During the expulsion from Missouri, Lorenzo Snow was on a mission, and only learned of what had happened by letters sent him from Eliza. Fleeing far west, the Snow family made it to Quincy, Illinois, on the banks of the Mississippi. Sickness abounded. People lived out of wagons and makeshift lean-tos made from driftwood and covered with blankets. People were starving. 
The Snow family had been relatively well off in Kirtland and even in Missouri, but this was the level of destitution that Eliza had never before experienced. Thousands of refugee Mormons. No prophet to guide, he was in jail. Nowhere to turn, forsaken by a government, hated by their neighbors. The Mormons were in complete survival mode. We can be sure that Eliza was using some of her trademarked herb crafting to make medicinal teas to alleviate the symptoms of some of the saints. This was a time in Mormon history where all hands were on deck. Nobody didn't have their shoulder to the plow. But it was a temporary gauntlet. Eventually, things normalized in Nauvoo. Public works projects were being erected all over the peninsula. The swamp was drained. Politicians made their way in and out of town, pledging to support the refugees. Public meeting buildings and houses were being built faster than bricks could be made and lumber cut to supply these projects. From the records that I've found, it, it seems that the Snow family stayed largely together during this period, even though the seven kids were almost all adults at this point. It wasn't unconventional, though, to have a single adult daughter living with her parents until she was given away in marriage, so this actually isn't surprising, just interesting to me. Lenora, Eliza's only older sibling, was a widow at this time. Eliza remained unmarried at the age of 36 in 1840 when the family located to La Harp, Illinois. That was pretty close to Quincy, about 30 miles south of Nauvoo. Chapter 9 of Lorenzo's biography, you know, written by Eliza, reveals an incredible revelation in light of what was being preached in Nauvoo compared to what Mormon doctrine was taught in Kirtland. Now, the I in this passage is referring to Lorenzo, not Eliza. Her narrative swaps without notice back and forth from her to Lorenzo. So this is a Lorenzo chapter. Quote, Early in the spring of 1840, I was appointed to a mission in England, and I started on or about the 20th of May. I here record a circumstance which occurred a short time previous, one which has been riveted on my memory, never to be erased. So extraordinary was the manifestation. At the time, I was at the house of Elder H.G. Sherwood. He was endeavoring to explain the parable of our Savior when speaking of the husbandmen who hired servants and sent them forth at different hours of the day to labor in his vineyard. While attentively listening to his explanation, the Spirit of the Lord rested mightily upon me. The eyes of my understanding were opened, and I saw, as clear as the sun at noonday, with wonder and astonishment, the pathway of God and man. I formed the following couplet, which expresses the revelation, as it was shown to me, and explains Father Smith's dark saying to me at a blessing meeting in Kirtland Temple, prior to my baptism, as previously mentioned in my first interview with the patriarch. Here's the couplet. As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. I felt this to be a sacred communication, which I related to no one except my sister Eliza, until I reached England, when, in a confidential private conversation with President Brigham Young in Manchester, I related to him this extraordinary manifestation. End quote. Now, to be clear, that phrase, as man now is, God once was, as God now is, man may become, that phrase was coined a long time before this was printed in 1884, but it's worth noting its presence claimed to have been from 1840, given by the spirit of revelation to Lorenzo Snow, which he immediately told only his sister Eliza about when the revelation came to his mind. The more I read from this biography, it truly reveals how close Eliza and Lorenzo were. While Lorenzo was with the other eight of the Quorum of England setting up the church over there. Eliza wrote a poem to him with a sense of deep yearning to see her brother again, who'd been gone for over a year by this point and still wouldn't be back to Nauvoo for another 27 months after this was drafted and sent to him. Here it is. To Elder Lorenzo Snow Dearest brother, wherefore leave us? Why forsake your friends and home? Of your presence, why bereave us and in foreign countries roam? Must the dearest ties be broken? Must affection's garland fade? No, oh no, but God has spoken, and his voice must be obeyed. You have gone to warn the nations in the name of Israel's God. You are called to bear salvation's joyful tidings far abroad. Now the gospel proclamation must be sounded far and near, that the best of every nation may in Zion's courts appear. In the spirit of devotion to Messiah's glorious cause, you have crossed the pathless ocean to proclaim redemption's laws. 
you are now a standard bearer on a distant mountain top, and perchance oft times a sharer in privation's bitter cup. God designs to try and prove you, if you will his voice obey. Therefore from your friends who love you, you are parted far away. You are called yourself to sever from the land where kindred dwell, but it will not be forever. Time will surely break the spell. Here warm friends await your greeting, noble friends of Abram's line. Here are gentle pulses beating and soft unison with thine. Here are daily prayers ascending for the pointed hour to come. When your mission nobly ending, we shall bid you welcome home. When Lorenzo got home to Nauvoo, and that was in April of 1843, some incredible changes had transpired in the church. Eliza was distraught with how to tell her brother about the changes, because, <laughs> well, they had impacted her and the church in ways that we could never understand. But before we get to that passage out of the biography, let's just catch up with what Eliza had gone through prior to this conversation with her brother. First off, as one of the closest friends of the elect lady, Emma Hale Smith, Eliza was appointed secretary of the Nauvoo Women's Relief Society with Emma as president in 1842. Her position as secretary was more than just writing the minutes of the meetings. She also held a significant stake and say in what transpired in the Female Relief Society. Now, to exhibit how crucial Eliza's role was, I offer the meeting minutes of the 19th April 1842 Relief Society. Eliza gave a blessing to Prescindia Buell, who had been initiated into the society by being administered to, quote-unquote. A number of women were given the opportunity to speak freely about their past experiences when being administered to by the other sisters. It's kind of a long quote, but it is, I think, quite fascinating. Quote, Mrs. Buell, who resided at a distance, was deprived of the privileges enjoyed by the sisters in Nauvoo and wished to become a member of this society. There was not much business to be attended to. Therefore, we might spend the time in religious exercises before the Lord, spoke of the happiness she felt in the present association of females, and made very appropriate remarks respecting the duties and prospects of the society, that it was organized after the order of heaven, etc. Counselor Elizabeth Ann Whitney also made interesting remarks and invited all present to speak their sentiments freely. Mrs. Buell arose and said that she rejoiced in the opportunity, that she considered it a great privilege. She felt that the Spirit of the Lord was with the society and rejoiced to become a member, although residing at a distance and could not attend the meetings. Mrs. Elizabeth Davis Durfee bore testimony to the great blessing she received when administered to, after the close of the last meeting, by President Emma Smith, Councillors Cleveland, and Whitney. She said she never realized more benefit through any administration, that she was healed and thought the sisters had more faith than the brethren. And then Eliza gave a blessing to Prescindia Huntington Buell. Miss Eliza R. Snow, after making observations with regard to the society, the importance of acting in wisdom and walking humbly before God, etc., said she had a blessing to Mrs. Buell, that inasmuch as she had become a member of the society, as the spirit of a person pervades every member of the body, so shall the spirit of the Lord, which pervades this society, be with her, and she shall feel it and rejoice. She shall be blessed wherever she is, and the Lord shall open the way, and she shall be instrumental in doing much. Through her own exertions, by the instrumentality of others, she shall be enabled to contribute much to the fund of the society. She shall warm up the hearts of those who are cold and dormant, and shall be instrumental in doing much good. End quote. Eliza Snow was a force to be contended with in Nauvoo. She was smart, witty, and, and she held prominent social status among the Mormon elites. She had the ear of Emma Smith at her beck and call. She fraternized with the other women that I read off in that minute book passage. Eliza was at the crux of everything happening in Nauvoo. Eliza, Emma, and Joe were all very close with each other. Eliza had lived with the saints off and on for most of her years in Mormonism. Eventually, the relationship developed to the point that Joseph Smith felt comfortable approaching Eliza with the doctrine of celestial marriage. Quote, In Nauvoo, I first understood that the practice of plurality of wives was to be introduced into the church. The subject was very repugnant to my feelings. So directly was it in opposition to my educated prepossessions that it seemed as though all the prejudices of my ancestors for generations past congregated around me. 
but when I reflected that I was living in the dispensation of the fullness of times, embracing all other dispensations, surely plural marriage must necessarily be included. And I consoled myself with the idea that it was far in the distance and beyond the period of my mortal existence. It was not long, however, after I received the first intimation, before the announcement reached me that the set time had come, that God had commanded his servants to establish the order by taking additional wives. I knew that God was speaking. As I increased in knowledge concerning the principle and design of plural marriage, I grew in love with it. End quote. Thus, in June 1842, Joe and Eliza were married in the celestial sense. Eliza became Joe's 14th wife, if we count Fanny Alger and Lucinda Morgan Pendleton. In her later life, Eliza became one of the strongest advocates for the practice of and pillars of support for those affected by polygamy. This marriage to Joe was secretive. We're going to continue to keep Eliza in mind as we progress through the remainder of 1842 and then get into early 1843. Something happens. Nobody truly knows what happened, but it did. And we'll discuss that at a later time. Regardless of the circumstance of what happened in 1843, Joe and Eliza Snow were married to each other, sealed together for time and eternity, at which time Eliza began to advocate for the secretive practice of polygamy. When Lorenzo finally got back to Nauvoo after his long time in Europe, Eliza decided that it was time her younger brother learned what had been going on in his absence. Quote, While my brother was absent on this, his first mission to Europe, changes had taken place with me, one of eternal import, of which I supposed him to be entirely ignorant. The prophet Joseph had taught me the principle of plural or celestial marriage, and I was married to him for time and eternity. In consequence of the ignorance of most of the saints, as well as the people of the world on this subject, it was not mentioned only privately between the few whose minds were enlightened on the subject. Not knowing how my brother would receive it, I did not feel at liberty and did not wish to assume the responsibility of instructing him in the principle of plural marriage, and either maintained silence or, to his indirect questioning, gave evasive answers, until I was forced by his cool and distant manner to feel that he was growing jealous of my sisterly confidence, that I could not confide in his brotherly integrity. I could not endure this. Something must be done. I informed my husband of the situation and requested him to open the subject to my brother, a favorable opportunity soon presented, and seated together on the lone bank of the Mississippi River, they had a most interesting conversation. The prophet afterwards told me that he found that my brother's mind had been previously enlightened on the subject in question, and was ready to receive whatever the spirit of revelation from God should impart. That comforter, which Jesus said should lead into all truth, had penetrated his understanding, and while in England had given him an intimation of what at that time was, to many, a secret. This was the result of living near the Lord and holding communion with him. End quote. So with everything today, needless to say... Our relationship is a little bit complicated, but I don't think Eliza minds that fact. You know, it's a, still a new relationship. It hasn't lost its sheen. And you know, look, I, I've heard from some of Eliza's friends that there are some things about Eliza that I should know about. I've heard that she's into the whole magic and Wicca stuff with all of the ointment laden broom handles and the talismans, which, you know, that doesn't really work with my, you know, perspective of a cold hard skeptic, but we may have some conflicts there. I've also heard that she spent most of her Utah years at the right hand of bloody Brigham Young, you know, the female counterpart to his iron-fisted theocratic control. I know that she preached to women in Utah Relief Societies that they're way too entitled while she herself was wearing a silk dress. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure what to think about that. And I'm also pretty sure that she helped coerce young girls into polygamy unwillingly. And that really causes me some deep inner conflict. So for the time being, I'm just going to try and ignore that and just let those facts you know, not take away from the luster and excitement in our relationship here. Just let me have this, okay? 
It's her mind. It's her lightning quick wit. It's her resilience and fortitude and living counter to the dictates of the society in which she lived. It's her poetry. It's her social commentary, not buying into the religious and patriotic dogma that was plaguing the simpletons of her era. It's Eliza Snow's dynamic character and charisma that I find so incredibly attractive. She didn't care what people said about her. Eliza just did her Eliza thing and nobody could stop her. She was strong-willed. She was powerful. When she entered the room, people didn't know what to say, think, or how to talk to her. The entire room's attention turned to Eliza whenever she chose to walk through the door. To some, Eliza was a Julie Andrews, writing church hymnals. To others, she was an Aaron Brockovich, trying to bring justice to those subjugated by the powers that be. To many others, though, Eliza Snow was a Cersei Lannister. We'll get to know her as time progresses. All right, let's. I'm just going to be real for a second, okay? The reason that I find Eliza Snow so fascinating and compelling of a character in Mormon history is because she left so much behind. Very few women who lived as her contemporaries left behind a fraction of what she did. Of all of the women that I've studied in early Mormon history, she stands out so much because. She actually has definition. She was one of the few women that historians can actually get a grasp on. Every single person living in her time was just as dynamic and unique as her, albeit in different ways, but so few ever left behind a legacy like hers. Those other people are so ill-defined that we're almost talking about ghosts of a different time. Eliza is alive and vibrant, and she's exciting in my mind because there's so much information about her, and there's so much from her own hand, which makes her even more compelling. You can spend decades reading only her information, only what she wrote herself. Her contemporaries wrote about her, but she wrote much more about herself, and that's only if we're taking her poems into consideration. With everything else that she wrote, all the minute books, the surviving letter correspondences, the biographical sketches she drafted, few women in early Mormonism are so well-defined in a historical sense as Eliza Snow. So I'm going to do my best to interweave the story of Eliza and other prominent female figures into the timeline as we move forward. Maybe, and this may just be, you know, a pipe dream at this point, but maybe one day naked Mormonism will finally pass the Bechdel test, but it would be so much easier to pass it if Mormon history, as it was initially recorded, ever passed the Bechdel test. That's going to do it for today. We have a couple of new patrons to thank. Looks like we have Michael, Joe, and uh, a pledge edit by Bevan. So to the new patrons as well as the pledge edit, thank you all so much for pledging to support the show at patreon.com slash naked Mormonism. Just a little heads up for everyone who is not queued into the Patreon exclusive feed. You get an extra episode every week. And what we have been going through lately is the Nemo Book Club of... The history of the saints. So we are covering the, as you know, we're progressing through episodes here. We're interweaving what's going on with John C. Reckett Bennett and his history expose, history of the saints published in 1842 is a massive book, 350 some odd pages, which was compiled in a few months time. That's why I say it was massive because it was so hastily slapped together, but it's a very fascinating book so far. Um, we are now moving on to that. So we have now concluded the John Whitmer history of the church circa 1847. The next book that we're reading through the Nemo book club is that John C. Bennett history of the saints. So with all of that, there's a couple of things coming up that I am uh, stockpiling episodes for quite frankly. So we have the John Whitmer historical conference coming up here in uh, September 20th through 22nd. I believe it is I'm going to be happening in Missouri. So I'm going to fly out for that. And we also have the QED conference coming up in the middle of October. That is in Manchester, UK, Manchester, England, I should say. And that is going to be happening October 11th through the uh, 13th. Sorry. So 
I'm going to be spending a month in Europe, my first time in Europe. So instead of uh, putting together extra Patreon episodes and then just not publishing during the entire month of October that I'm going to be out there, I'm instead spending all of my time stockpiling episodes for you guys. So hopefully I will have at least two to three history episodes to publish during the month of October that I'll be gone. Those will be coming out at the regular time. And I'm also stockpiling these patron special episodes of reading through the history of the saints, which is basically just an audiobook with my commentary peppered in as we go. And that's going to just, you know, set the stage for us as we are moving into September and October here. So with all that said, thank you all of the patrons who do support the show. And I hope you enjoy all of the extra content. And, you know, if you are listening on Patreon, be sure to, you know, keep in after the closing music to get the audio journal so all right let's go ahead and shut it down for the evening of course a huge thanks to my wonderful partner annie for reading the poem at the beginning thank you all so much for listening i hope to talk to you next time here on the naked mormonism podcast This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres as legal counsel. Music is provided by Jason Camo of alawstateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.